Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Holy Week. Yay. <laughs> what? It is a yay. Wow, okay. Yeah, we all come here with different thoughts on our minds, don't we? But it is good to know that whatever we're coming with, this is a place we belong. Friends, we've got some stuff on our bulletins as announcements to be aware of. Um, sun, the Easter sunrise service at Oberlin Baptist Church down the way is at 6.30 on Sunday. Please do RSVP. And if you have rsvp please do that again. The phones were out this week, and so if you left a message, it did not get got. Um, so uh, do that again if you would like to, to join our neighbors in that. Um, and next week is Easter. Mm. But this week, we're waiting on Easter. We've got our Monday, Thursday service uh, this Thursday at 7. So please uh, come out for that if you're able. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship.
Pray with me. Oh, Lord God, this morning we do come praising your name. We do come singing hallelujah, what a Savior. We do come shouting hosanna as we remember the day of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that triumphant entry, Father, that, as we know, led to a cruel, cruel death. But, Father, in your infinite wisdom, led to a glorious resurrection. And so we begin a week of where we remember. We begin a week, Father, this morning, as we come to your house of worship to do just that, to worship you, to bow before your throne of grace in worship and in adoration, in thanksgiving, and in praise. Lord, be with us as we go through this time together. May you, through the Holy Spirit, work in our individual lives as is needed And Lord, we just give you the praise and glory as I pray this prayer in the most precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Justin, I'm surprised you didn't say something about it being winter again. It's pollen season. season. So what does that make it? Wind pollering or something like that? Yeah, okay, I agree. Okay. Um, Understand, Miss Stephanie has a day today, this special, her 39th birthday. Again. And again. We're glad to have you, Stephanie. Um, Patrick. I see you peeking there as well. I know Stan will probably say more. Let's sing, y'all. Praise him, 172, standing as we sing, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Would you 
turn to one another and greet them today, please. Thank you. And as we begin to pray together, I'll just mention a few names. Uh, Shelton goes Wednesday to tell the doctor what you already know, right? I think, yeah, <laughs> things are good. That's a good thing, but it's good to see you both. Pepper, I, doctor was pleased with the results of your eye. Go again, Thursday. Okay, okay, good. Going to be a week-long celebration. Daughter's birthday? Uh, no. no. Y y yes. No. <laughs> Patrick, good to see you. I uh, got good words about Amanda. She is out of the hospital into a uh, local rehab. What was the name? Pruitt Health. Pruitt Health Rehab and, and is doing very well there. Continue to remember her in prayer. Um, Remember Ann Wall's sister, Diana, that's, that's just an ongoing, they're just balance, it's a balancing act. And, of course, the sister's in Colorado, and Ann is here, and all of her work, and so she's trying to balance all of that. So remember Ann. Are there other, you, you see our list, continue to pray, it makes such a difference. Let's pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for the gifts of life today. The beautiful sunshine, uh, and even though the green cloud is enveloping everything, we still see the blooming new life coming back to remind us that resurrection really does happen. We thank you for family and friends, the opportunity to list our brothers and sisters and their family members and friends in, on this list. And we pray for them and we thank you for that opportunity and for the results that our praying give. We thank you for the opportunity just to be your people in a world that um, literally all around us seems to be in such turmoil. And though we often do come and bring our needs to you today, we pause as a family to be reminded that even with the good things that are happening around us, the good reports, the beauty, family and friends, there are still those days that are a struggle for us. Whether it is personal to us within either our own lives or the lives of our immediate nuclear family, um, or whether it's systemic. For one thing that um, the World Wide Web has brought us is intimacy with every event around the world. We now know when some tragedy happens, 
literally on the other side of the world. And God, we confess that at times we feel that anxiety so much. It causes us at best to limp and sometimes not even to be able to get up out of the chair. The trauma that surrounds us sometimes overwhelms us. But we know we are not alone. And so we gather together every week in this place. And we sing the songs of our faith and we hear the ancient words of the record of people who are trying to live their life under your leadership and your lordship. We pray together. We worship together. Remind us again today of the power of being together in your name. For wherever two or three are gathered, you have promised you are here with us. And your another promise that you give to us is to say, come. Come to you, all who are weary and worn. And your promise is, you will give us rest. Forgive us when we neglect that gift. And remind us We are your children. And quite often we just need to climb into your lap and sit for a while. Hear our prayer this day, loving God, for we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. These are the words of Scripture that when the Word of God took up flesh, He declared it to be the greatest teaching that has been given. Thanks be to God. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn 175. All glory, laud, and honor. Would you stand please as we sing these three stanzas. i 
Thank you. Be seated. Imagine, imagine tomorrow having to wake up, pack what you can put in one bag and leave your home for good because of some war or persecution or some injustice that is happening. We see it, we read about it, it is still hard to imagine how that might be. And yet, there are people all around the world reaching out to those refugees. We do it here, Welcome House, we do it here at Oak City Cares, but you also do it when you give. Last year, 2023, a North Carolina native, Stella Perrin, was commissioned to work in Cyprus, a very small country in Europe, but the largest per capita in terms of population of those seeking asylum in Europe. They have a larger number per capita. And she began her work there last year in trying to be a welcoming presence to folks who have literally been uprooted and moved away. Thank you for giving to support Stella in the work that she does to help folks who have lost everything find a new place to live.
Thank you, Eddie. I invite you to take the text you have brought with you, and I always encourage you to bring a text of some kind, electronic or printed, but I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. There are two unnamed women in the life of Jesus in this last week that we tend to skip over quite a bit, but there are two who I think make a significant contribution to Jesus' life during this week. Uh, one is the widow who gave two little coins. We'll look at her story maybe next year. But today we are going to read about this one who anointed Jesus. And I invite you to take special attention not only to the words, but to the structure of this passage. There are three distinct parts. Those become important to, I think, what Mark is trying to say. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. Part 1. Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief, scribe, chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to seize Jesus in secret to kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival... Otherwise, there might be a riot of the people. Thought two. While Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. She broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for almost a year's salary and the money given to the poor. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Part three, third idea. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to betray Jesus to them. Now they were glad when they heard of this and promised to give him money. Judas began seeking how to portray Jesus at an opportune time. This is the disheartening record of the darkness of man and the lightness of some. Thanks be to God. This is Palm Sunday. Thanks for the display I, when I came in it was so simple and yet pulled my attentions right to this day it is also called Passion Sunday Palm being uh, the celebration of the triumphal entry Passion being the beginning of Jesus last week and the struggles for most of my life and most of the Sundays in Baptist life, we have centered on Palm Sunday. And I would love to tell you about the parade. I want to tell you about the people shouting and singing, about how they broke branches off palm trees, how they waved those branches to show the intensity of their joy and of their expectation. Here he comes, here he comes. I want to tell you about people taking off their coats and spreading them on the ground before Jesus, just as their ancestors had done for David upon 
his return from battles. You see, there were people at this parade that day who literally had witnessed or had themselves received the grace and healing of God. They had seen the mighty works and they were eager to welcome him in. And as the choir has proclaimed, who is this king of glory? They were shouting, strong and mighty is he. But there were other people at this parade. Somewhere in the move from Clinton to Hershey, from Hershey to Columbia, and Columbia to Raleigh, <laughs> I lost a painting. I invited my office. You'll see there's four paintings right by my desk. One of them uh, is, is to the right, and it's a Baptist Sunday School Board artist rendition of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. I also had one of Jesus' triumphal entry. And you see Jesus on the donkey, and in the front row are all the people who are shouting, Hallelujah, Hosanna, in the highest, and all of that. But right in behind them are the people with frowns on their faces, and their body language is turned, and they're like, Hmm. See, they had had enough of this upstart teacher who had challenged their positions of power and authority and control, and it was their intent. To find a way to get rid of Jesus. So though we imagine this celebratory Palm Sunday parade. There's a lot of tension going on. People are on edge. And Jesus knows it. Tuesday of this past week, Justin and I attended a conference that Campbell Divinity School hosts every year. It's called the Kamek Preaching Lecture Series, I think. Great stuff. I've always found these local kinds of things to be really, really some of the best stuff I've ever attended. This year's preacher presenter was Dr. Kimberly Wagner, assistant professor of preaching at Princeton Theological Seminary. That's Chicago, right, I think? Well, she kept talking about Chicago. Okay. I should get my facts right before I say anything. <laughs> well, I thought it was Princeton, New Jersey, too, and then she kept talking about Chicago. It's north of here. <clears throat> <laughs> and it's a theological seminary. Get on 95 and just kind of go that way. Okay. Her focus was helping the church to find a better way to deal with the times of stress and anxiety and trauma that occur not only in our individual lives but in, in our corporate lives together. In the afternoon session, she basically began by, by just defining the ways that, in which the church historically has responded to trauma. It can be summed up basically in this thought. Let's get over this as quick as possible and get back to what's normal. Jesus, Jesus is raised from the dead. He'll raise you from the dead. Thanks be to God. Let's move on. It's what the Protestant church has done with Passion Week. Notice that in not every expression in the Protestant church, but in the one I grew up in, I didn't even know there was such a thing as Holy Week. I just knew we came in one Sunday and we were shouting hallelujah because we were waving palms. And the next time we got together, it was Resurrection Sunday. Trauma over. Everything done. And for years and years, that's just what I thought how it was. But I am grateful that I have, in my later years, grown up in a tradition that is trying to embrace... The days in between. Palm Sunday, or Palm, is that how you say it, Jay? Palm Sunday, and Easter. And the more that I spend time in those days in between, the more I am convinced 
that's where the power of resurrection is. In those stories. Today's text is a story of an unnamed woman. Sandwiched in between two difficult passages. Remember I said pay attention to the structure. The passage begins thought one with those in charge trying to figure out how they're going to kill Jesus. That's some pretty traumatic stuff. It ends third thought and it's clearly defined in mind. I have a paragraph marking with each of those three. It ends with Judas going out to begin the process of betraying Jesus. So, trauma, trauma, anxiety, anxiety, tension, tension. But sandwiched in between is this story that really is significant. She appears out of nowhere, unnamed, without a resume. She just simply shows up into this company that Jesus was keeping. And understand even how courageous that was. For a woman to step into a man's meeting. (laughs) That may fly over a lot of our heads today, but not then. What she brings into this gathering is beauty. Alabaster. It's a mineral stone that could almost be translucent in the right light. If you're familiar with moonstone, same kind of thing. Nard, an expensive A year's worth of wages. Julie, what would you do if Mark bought a bicycle that cost a year's worth of his wages? Never mind. Don't answer that. (laughs) It was used for calming and for preparing bodies for burial. And then the act itself, again, a woman touching Jesus' head as she pours the compound upon his hair. Like Jesus, she has picked up on the tension. She is aware, she knows that something is going on and that it is focused and centered in that individual that's seated before her. And so she begins where she is. What do I have? What can I do? What risk am I willing to take? It doesn't say, but I can't imagine that she simply went out that afternoon and bought the nard. She had already purchased it. It was was a very special gift for her. And yet she looks up and sees, I have that. And so she walks in unexpected and uninvited to offer her love and gratitude to the one who was in danger and need. And Jesus welcomed her action. No one else did. You get that very clearly. Jesus is grateful to accept an act of pure love amid the hostilities of the day. Remember the sandwich. Remember where this text is. Tough news. Tough news. Her act. It's a sweet interlude of peace in the middle of a gathering storm. A moment of worship. Is it dramatic and exceeding the limits of reason? Or necessity? Yes. Is it lacking in moderation, balance, or restraint? Certainly. It is extremely expensive? Absolutely. But none of this matters. Jesus needs a hug. And she's going to give him one. As is always the case with any text, we want to understand what is going on there, but we also want to pay attention where this text might intersect with our own lives. And maybe there is a word for us also in learning how to cope with the traumatic moments in our own lives 
the stressful moments in our own lives. Notice that what the woman does does not stop the violence, does not stop the betrayal to follow, but for a moment provides some peace. It is an act of worship. You see, worship in its best form is when the people of God gather to, in essence, do something for God. Right? God, you all are not the audience and we're not the performers. God is the audience in worship. God gathers with us and says, let me hear what you're going to say. Let me hear the songs you're going to sing. Let me hear what your heart is going to say to me and for me. We give, we praise, we listen, we offer gifts. Maybe there is something in this woman's act that can speak a word to us. Not all of our lives are filled with trauma. We have really good days, a lot of us. And we have good moments in some of the bad days. However, we are living, sociologists say, in one of the most unprecedented times of stress and disturbance in recent history. Whether it's personal, whether it's within you or within your immediate family or a very close friend, or whether it is systemic, stuff that is happening by people we'll never meet, we know them, but we'll never meet them, and done in other places, but their actions impact us. And sandwiched in between the days of our lives that are filled with strain, we are given the opportunity to step into a bubble that we call Worship. To give ourselves to God, to pull ourselves away from all that is happening, not to forget it. Remember the structure, it's on either end. But to come and for a moment to give ourselves in worship to God. Remember also that worship is a gift from God, it's one of the big ten. Do you remember that? It's called what? Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, God says. Now, we've made it a law and we've made it all kinds of stuff. But we forget that the creator of the universe and the creator of you and the creator of me gave it to us in the beginning as a gift. And maybe there's a reason. God knows that in the midst of our lives, just as Jesus knew, there has to be these moments when we stop, when we pause, when we do something that is completely different almost from the rest of our lives. For you see, as we are obedient to remember the Sabbath, we participate in it. We are given strength to go back into our daily living armed with courage and resolve and commitment. So this unnamed woman does for us what we say we want to do. Love God with everything we have. The story doesn't tell us what she did after she anointed Jesus. But it does tell us what Judas did. For Judas leaves the dinner to go and begin the betrayal of Jesus. And in the gathering storm clouds of Mark's gospel, things are going to go from bad to worse. Even his disciples, who especially in Mark's gospel are just slow studies, <laughs> are about to desert him. The story reminds us that if we're not careful, we'll get caught up in parts one and parts three of this text. 
we'll get caught up in all the trauma and tension and stress and intrigue and betrayal and injustice and forget that maybe this week Jesus simply needs for you and for me to take some time and do something for him. It's going to be a difficult week. God needs a hug. You know, funny thing about hugs, though, that I've learned is that when you give a hug, <laughs> you get a hug. Thanks be to God. The longer I read the text and read, read scripture, the more I discover that some of the most powerful lessons are by those that we don't even know their names. Maybe that's the truth we need to learn. And maybe just simply imitating what she did today, you have started by being You have started by pulling yourself away from, well, you know. <laughs> not to escape. This is not an escapist expression. This is not to forget. It is rather whose we are and that as we have come to say thanks to God and do what we can in worship to God God says now I will go with you and that's what begins to make a difference in our world today I hope you will respond to God. The hymn we're going to sing is really about a challenge to you to spend, to pay attention to these days in between Palm Sunday and Easter. Although the last one jumps to Easter pretty quick, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll allow one out of four. But listen as you sing and, and make a commitment. Jesus, I'm going to spend this time with you this week. Because it's hard to say God needs something, but... He needed that. He needed what that woman did that week. Leave her alone. I need her act. God needs us. Needs you. Needs you to bring all that you have. Give it to God as an act of worship. the two of you take off into the world until we come back together. If I can help in your response, you make that between you and God always, not to me, not to the church, not, not to any organization or person, but it's always to God. So even if you say, I'm not doing anything, you're making that response to God. But if I can help, if I can pray with you about a response, if I can help clarify some things you're thinking about, if, like Jan, you, you want to join with us, as she did several weeks ago, uh, and, and, and more intentionally plant your life here, you're, we're glad you're here. We're going to take you any way you're here. <laughs> but that might be something you'd like to do. If you want to rededicate, God, I've been kind of here and there, and maybe today that's what you know your response. Maybe you just want to come and sit or kneel near the front and pray. We'll keep singing until you're done. Whatever your response, you make it as we stand together and sing our hymn, uh, number 180.
Thank you for being with us today in worship, and God thanks you very much. Stephanie, happy birthday. May you have 39 for years to come. Patrick, good to see you. Please give Amanda our love. Good to see all of you today. Walk with Jesus this week. So much.